today's seminar speaker, Dr. Kristen Nelson. She completed her bachelor's degree at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, and her master's degree and PhD from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Kristen is currently a professor in the Department of Forest Resources and Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota, and she studies human dimensions of natural resources. And today she'll be discussing some of her latest work on residential yards and homeowner decisions social drivers of plant biodiversity and nutrient fluxes in urban ecosystems. So with that, I'll hand it off. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And thanks all for staying here on a Friday. It is air conditioned, so that's a benefit. Um, and thanks to the students for organizing this seminar. I know sometimes that can be challenging and lots of emails. Um, and all the faculty have taken a little time to talk to me. That was great. Um, I feel like I'm coming home a little bit. And it's only because the stories that my mom told me were about coming to a farm in Iowa because her dad was born in Iowa on what eventually became a century farm, if you know that designation. And they live in Huxley. Who would believe it? Um, but having grown up in New Jersey and traveling around the world, I never really ever got to Huxley that often, just occasionally. So it's really nice to visit the campus. First time I've been able to see it and talk to folks here. You are all invited to the St. Paul campus of the Twin Cities whenever you wish. It'd be lovely for you to come up or to interact with us as colleagues. So what this is will be a little different in that it's not a single paper, single study. It is a, an agenda of scholarship that I've been doing with my collaborators over the last eight years. Um, most of the work is published, so I'm going to assume you can get a hold of all the details as you wish. And I'm going to do it like a chain of TED Talks, short interactive pieces to show you the interdisciplinary nature of our work. And um, probably, hopefully, focus mostly on the work that's recently published in the last two years. So I am going to use the clicker. Do you, you comfortable? Where would you like me? On this side. Are you most comfortable? We'll see. All right. So ecosystems, urban ecosystems, not very common in a department of ecology, much less in a, a department of natural resources, but increasingly dominant in scholarship and in funding related to agencies and, and granting agencies. And it, why? Why urban ecosystems? Well, in part, to think of conceiving of a city as an urban ecosystem, it helps us think about sustainable f solutions. It helps us think of the urban space as actually it, an environmental challenge as well as a social and economic challenge. And so thinking along the lines of ecosystems has you know, produced uh, several journals recently and a lot of scholarship. There's been a flush of scholarship around this. The questions may vary in time and place, but they can be very similar to some of the stuff I've looked at your website and some of the stuff that you've been doing. And the implications, of course, have to do with a tremendous amount that this is a human and natural coupled system in which you can think of energy, food, water, biota, materials flowing into the system and cycling within the system and then some, in some form output through waste, through land, through air, um, through the water. And there's no way in a city you can avoid saying we need to look at physical, biological, and social elements of it because that is the nature of a city, both built and natural environment. And so this is one of the landscapes um, in Minneapolis and of course one of our major pieces that we share with Iowa is the Mississippi River going through Minneapolis. So I, there are, the first project was an initial relationship between engineers, ecologists, and myself as a sociologist who does psychological work as well. And we began the household, Twin Cities Household Urban Ecosystem Project. And today, what I will, and as you know, anyone who's done research for longer than a year understands it's not just you. It's the cohort of your intellectual colleagues, your graduate students, your undergrads, your, all who are part of your agencies who are part of the thinking. And these are just a few of them. And the, uh, my Larry Baker, um, Janine Kavanagh-Bear, and Sarah Hobby are the principal PIs that have kind of been the, 
cornerstones of this house. Um, today, I will talk a little bit about fertilization because Sarah is a nutrient uh, in ecologist and with nitrogen phosphorus. Larry is a water civil engineer hydrologist, very interested in biogeochemistry. Um, then Janine Kavanagh Bear is very interested in plant biodiversity. And then I blended, it doesn't, I don't care if it's agriculture or urban space or forests. Um, I'm looking at concepts of knowledge. What is knowledge and knowing? Um, today I'll talk about interventions to influence behavior and knowledge. And I, social norms, I've decided given the time frame, I'll, I'll cut that one. And I might even have to cut more. So you might see, go look at that paper type of talk later. But then finally coming back out to the whole ecological map, because you can talk about specific knowledge, but um, it, people put that within their framework of how they think of how the, the world works. So our first objective was first to quantify carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus through the household and elucidate those social and biophysical drivers. Structural, human behavioral, and policy options may be informed by this. We did a very um, complex method for us in terms of an urban ecosystem. We, the key point to do the CNNP was a household flux calculator that you can go look at online. And if, you know, actually, it's in the first paper, it's up um, for you to use and pull apart because you know, we've even improved on it since then. But the way we got the data was a mail survey, two households, independent, single households, um, a lawn model, so from the work of others, because we didn't have the resources to go measure what was happening in the lawn and the soil at that time. GIS and parcel data, which also gave us boundary issues and a variety of other um, information. And then we asked the household members for their energy records, and two thirds of them gave us permission. And we did land surveys. And what I learned about my ecologists is when I can do 1,000, they can do 100, right? So they, um, they visited a random sample uh, across the urban gradient and used the U4 model, those of you who might be familiar with that um, from the Forest Service, at that time for uh, some of the carbon mod modeling. And, and then we evaluated fluxes. I'm going to give you two, two slides on this. But the method in particular, after doing an exhaustive set of pilots, we figured out that these were the primary behaviors, the, the import into the household, and we're looking at not the entire indirect, we're looking at direct import. And today I'm going to talk mostly about landscape because of where I am and the, who I'm with. Uh, if I, I was with the Energy Authority, I'd talk about other behaviors. Um, this is, it was across the Ramsey and Noka County, if anybody knows, you know, sort of, here's St. Paul out to Cedar Creek, which is RL, Long-Term Ecological Research Center in Bethel, single detached home or occupied. Why? Because they can make a decision about their land as opposed to renters, as we were talking about with farmers who are renting land. Would I get, this was a huge survey. Oh, nobody's going to send it back. That's one of my problems, all right? So I did an exhaustive send. And we ended up with 3,300 responses. At that time, the largest urban household study that existed. Um, so we are using this for our models. We're not saying this is what people in Ramsey County do. We're doing, mostly doing it for scientific work. The landscape assessment was 360 households, which is rather robust um, uh, in the literature. And then Janine went across, because she was naming and counting every single plant on, in, on the yard, um, she did 137 households. So that gives you a, a sense after you can look at some of the data. Okay, what's our bias? All right, slightly older, slightly wealthier, and slightly more educated than the population in these two counties. And that's what we traditionally expect. And so we could wait, if we asked questions where it mattered, mattered we could wait that. All right, so let's just look at one graphic. This is uh, in the papers of Chinzia Fizori. She was our postdoc that, um, that did these first papers on the flux. 
And this is the total contribution of fluxes of inputs. So Chinzia went on and I didn't put slides in about outputs and Daniel has also done some more work on it. But let's look at nitrogen, all right? And so when you think about nitrogen, if everybody can percent of total we have here, and basically your sources are landscape, as you would expect, um, also the diet. But in terms of the talk today, that goes into a built system pretty much and goes through in our area through tertiary treatment. Still an issue, still an issue in terms of a bigger system, but um, not one that we were looking. And vehicle I'll leave off for today, you know, but vehicle actually um, contributed quite a bit of nitrogen. We're in a dense urban system. And some of our engineers have done more work on that with this data set. Uh, Let's look at water quality. One of the issues we care about fluxes, you know, so what? You know, my mom, first of all, couldn't figure out what I was talking about, and then trying to tie it to something she cared about, it had, I talked about local water pollution problems, perhaps in the case of nitrogen, um, or thinking about uh, what is happening with multiple yards across the urban ecosystem. And one of the primary hypotheses we had was looking at the concept of disproportionality. So where, who's fertilizing, where are they fertilizing? And so using that uh, theoretical construct, we find that in terms of these households, the, that 20% of the households are contributing about maybe a little under 70% of the end from fertilizing, 20%. All right, so what type of law would you create? What type of program would you create if you wanted to impact that population? Maybe a targeted type piece or thinking about, as we talked about with some of our Wisconsin colleagues, folks who are on slopes, if you're thinking about that, critical watershed areas, finding those 20%. But how do you find that 20%? And some of that has to do with what are the drivers. So I, many of you have homes in an urban space, right? Not all of you, because you have the luxury of living near rural space very close to work. But um, think about who in your neighborhood or who in this room contributes to that 20% of fertilizing your yard. What we found with the large data set in multivariate work, and just basically, that, that was another paper, but just a basic regression, is that we found the drivers for fertilizing and increased fertilizing were related to age. There was a difference in the amount of fertilizing it increased as the household owner was older. So think about that. Why would you think older household members might have more time for fertilizing and taking care of a yard after the kids move out that I'm just learning about? Lots of time to do things with my yard. Um, or a culture about the way your lawn should look in fertilizing. The social norms, fertilizing is good. Answer that question for me. Do your neighbors think you should fertilize? If the more that went up, the more likely they were to fertilize. The general evaluation that fertilizing provides a benefit, and that was on many sorts, um, more fertilized went up. Um, perceived capability. Can you fertilize your yard? Not all can, right? But fertilizing in general is a pretty accessible behavior. And so that, that influenced it. This is very much uh, correlations, right? And so it gave us an idea of what to look at. The only place was a structural. You notice we're looking at structural factors, demographic, sociodemographic, and psychological factors. So this is an interdisciplinary study at that level. And structurally, the age of house. And those folks in landscape architecture, if anybody's in here, they know that, you know, chapter three. Age of house, when a development went in, when the house went in. But you see it's a negative, so less fertilizing. In that area where I did the study, trees took over, less lawn. Um, you have uh, all, all the way out to, to Blaine, it's cornfields moved into devel developments 10 years ago versus downtown houses that you know, went in with the early mills. All right. 
So age of house mattered. What the, how that informs us is a question. All right, so the next question, so nutrients, we can do that with a variety of nutrients, but related to nitrogen, that was one example and in Fizori's paper. Sonia Knapp from Germany had done some work at, when, with Janine Kavanagh Bear in ecology to look at yards. So you all work very much in forests and maybe in agriculture and prairies, but in, in the urban ecosystem, what's happening to the plant biodiversity? All right. What, um, there are a lot of hypotheses. Are, are we a barren landscape of biodiversity? Is it all three plants? If you could pick the trees in an urban space, the forest students here could tell you right away what are the four trees in an urban space. The wildlife folks would tell you what are the four birds in an urban space. So, or is there really biodiversity we don't know about that's being conserved by homeowners in their choices? So what factors drive it? So this paper is quite a, a complex, and Janine and I are writing a paper about the social variables right now, and I didn't have, we don't, we didn't want to release the model, so that will be coming. But in general, what she found was Cedar Creek, right? The native, what would have been there across the urban gradient in terms of urban yards. And in general, the take home message is there are more species in urban yards, more species, fewer, fewer lineages, fewer lineages. So in Minnesota, and I don't know how well you guys support this, we have a lot of hosta, which is a plant that grows in shade, multiple species of a particular lineage, all right? And so what does that mean for the biodiversity in the urban landscape? What does that mean for those of you who care about conservation of bees, butterflies, things like that? What does it mean for the functioning of nitrogen, um, carbon? So the preliminary thought for us on this second, um, where we're really looking, this is a larger study of six cities. And what we are doing here is asking the question about spontaneous. That would be, as I understand it, she has a very pre uh, big defined term for spontaneous. But spontaneous would be what's in the seed bank, right? I didn't put it there, but it's still there because you were able to count it. I let it grow. That's my decision, right? I mean, not to have planted it, but to have permitted it to grow. Um, uh, so versus cultivated, I put it there. So we walk the land with people. Did you put that in there? Did you plant that? Or was it planted before? And then um, what we found w is with homeowner vegetation criteria, when they picked, what that influenced was strongly associated with cultivated species. Makes sense. You go to the yard, Home Depot, you go to the, that's in, tw what, what's your place that urban growers go, is there any dominant big store or do you have enough variety here? Huh? Lowe's? Okay. Um, half, of which, half of which cultivated species were exotic. All right. Um, but the spontaneous didn't follow the vegetation criteria that the homeowner suggested. All right. So it wasn't that they were leaving them because they had criteria for that. They were just, they were just there. Wildlife criteria associated with higher cultivated native and cultivated species. Not emergent, you know, spontaneous, but cultivated. I am taking coneflower and I'm putting it in my yard because I want native gardens. Uh, and it's a variety that's been cultivated. Higher species richness of cultivated species associated with home value and education. Right? And then the phylogenetic diversity is either not affected or negatively affected by most of the social drivers. Now, more to come, all right? Because we're really doing one more test against more native. We have now more sites than Cedar Creek to test against. So we're gonna be looking at this and be sure we're right. That was great, but it doesn't give me a lot of why or how. That's a lot of what. So as a sociologist, qualitative data 
and some quantitative with explanation associated helps me. So we focused on a yard care study that was same area, Twin Cities, same general area, but because we were doing such in-depth work, we focused on a urban Highland Park uh, just near the airport, if anybody's been in the Twin Cities, across the river though, and Lionel Lakes, second ring suburb. We wanted to see what was going on in yards and we w had an idea of um, beginning to have an intervention. So we got more data on what they're actually doing in the yard, watering, fertilizing, all sorts of data related to leaf removal, biomass removal, or, or integration composting. So that survey's online. You can go look at it, compare it to the work you're doing. Pretty robust sample. I eliminated all the folks who had been in the previous one, so I didn't influence them because they were in the same sample area broadly. And then we offered them a chance after the survey from those 900 to come and talk to us or for two, tw two times that summer or um, to get information. Because in this new age, we, um, you know, a lot of people don't want to take the time to go and be personal and sit in a discussion group, don't have the time, don't want to take the time. Um, but they will receive information. And there's an argument that maybe we just are in information age and they can just use that information. So if you're thinking about farmers, maybe the younger ones, you know, just do it online or, you know, send them the information and they will work with it. So we want to see would it matter because they, the costs are really different, right? For, you know, investing in discussion groups. So we do have an intervention in, in this study. So there are a variety of papers out of this. How am I doing? I want to be sure not to, you with me on where I am? Okay, and I'm loud enough for you in the back? Stand up when you fall asleep because it's now almost four o'clock, okay? <laughs> okay, here's the data on the fertilizing. Now we have many more variables we've asked. Before I was given three pages of, you know, hardly any questions. Pages are gold in surveys to, to social scientists. Martini, this is in Environment and Behavior, which is a social psychological journal. Um, why feed the lawn? In general, in the model, uh, structural factors, sociodemographic norms, beliefs, concerns, motivations, abilities, all had some influence. So what's the bottom line on that one? It's not that it, we don't believe it's because it's a bad model. It's because this is a complex behavior, right? This isn't going to be an easy shot. Tell them about what their neighbors think. Right? It's going to be more complex. The variables we measured, and we did, and this one we used an odds ratio. I'm just throwing it for the social scientists who might be interested. Because it was really, we asked these questions in a kind of yes, no way. Did you or didn't you fertilize um, in that year? Proximate behavior. They could say yes or no to something. Not not some kind of socially constructed, do you, because I can lie to that, or I can be generally correct or vaguer. Um, fertilizing frequency, how much? We finally got to ask frequency, so we got that, you know, where, this, where is the disproportionality? Um, high fertilizers, four plus times. Are they really the, is that really the tail that's, that's wagging the dog? Does that make sense? So these are all yes, no's. And structural was whether they were a uh, suburb or, inner, uh, or in the city, that's Highland Park variable. The lot size, bigger lots maybe, more fertilizing, bigger lawn. Um, do you use a lawn company? All right, because wood, that's a, so, that is a political ecology question. And you don't start looking at individuals, you look at the larger market structure then. Um, Sociodemographic, market value we used for the house as, a, as an indicator for income. Um, length of home ownership might, might matter. Pets, why do you have grass if you do? Does your dog like to roll in it, run around? Do you have young children? Um, age, given our last study, education, 
and uh, gender. Okay, so yep. Um, cognitive variables in social psychology and the theory of planned behavior, uh, attitudes are formed by a cognitive process and you know, our behavioral economists now are very enamored of psychology and asking about what are the advantages and disadvantages of something, all right? Thinking that if you feed information to people, they will weigh that information in advantages and, and make a, a rational decision. Um, do they know if their stormwater is treated? Do they think it doesn't matter because it gets done later? I don't have to do it. The city will do it, right? Because they may think that it's not a problem. Uh, does fertilizing equal pollution? People have scientists debate about that, right? So do they even associate fertilizing with pollution? Or does it, from our previous studies, does it make your lawn attractive? Is there a benefit for you? Or is it easy? And then affect, which is different than cognitive. Sometimes, have you ever done anything that is not reasonable, right? Sometimes we do it and sometimes that affect has to do with what my grandfather did, what I did as a teenager for my parents, what I feel about who I am as a citizen, all right? So affect related to that and then motivations related to the actual affect of this being able to happen on my yard, my kids and my pets. Has anyone watched their grandchildren play in the yard? It has an emotional component to it. Um, all right, here's TED Talk results. It's all in the paper, you can look at it. Basically, in this study, as I began with, there's no single solution. There's no, it's not cognitive. You're not gonna do one flyer. It's not social norms only. We did associate higher application rates with norms. So if you have a disproportional group that's applying four plus times, a norm, the reason they're doing it is because they have the strongest belief that they should do it for the community, for the neighborhood, right? So that might be a, a targeted group. Um, and they use lawn companies, that one, might be a policy change behavior, right? If lawn companies are no longer allowed to apply fertilizer four times, or if they do, they have to pay an environmental fee. Cognitive beliefs were dominant. So the, my, uh, Nick, he really believes in knowledge, and he was so happy to find that out. And so now I had, I had to check for bias in his analysis because of that, because you know, I'm, what, he, what you, what's good about cognitive for us as scientists is that adding knowledge could help in critical components. For example, if you understood that it's not treated by the city, the storm sewer in Minneapolis, in my area, it might be in yours, no way, right? So um, easier to change with substantial influence, you know, you have a better odds if you're going to invest some money around these single behaviors relating to fertilizing. All right? So in terms of designing programs or policy, how are we doing? Another one? Different question, different paper. So then that caused us to say a l small paper on knowledge because I was, we were th sitting here thinking, one of the things we know about, we wonder about farmers, and somebody in the audience may know more about this, or foresters, is, well, they really know their ecosystem, they know what they're working in, you know, so their instrumental knowledge of what should I do in this corn row or in this forest row may also be tied to an ecosystem knowledge, right? A, a whole system effect, not just my decision affects me. So that, does that, that was an argument, right? That's what a hypothesis is. So we asked this about knowledge and its instrumental knowledge being BMPs for lawns. And essentially, what we found about these homeowners is that they averaged three out of five of the BMPs for a lawn. So should I test you guys? Just keep. All right, so in terms of lawn and sustainable lawn practices, what's one thing you should do? Leave it long. Leave it long. The, uh, yeah? 
Uh, see, isn't this interesting? It's, uh, what does Mo mean? Who said Mo? Okay. Mo, well, why? Mow the grass. Oh, okay. All right. Cut it, cut it off so it has to grow. Leave it long so the root system is long, picks up more nutrients, gets more. All right. All right. So three and a half is generally what my guys say. Uh, leave the clippings on the lawn, one fertilizing, right? So that's the kind of BMP we were using. Very simple because, of, uh, it, because it was the survey. So this says, no, they, these guys know. But there's room to grow in terms of training about better practices. Um, variation in, in instrumental knowledge. So there's variation. So here's an example of one of the things they didn't quite understand. That if they irrigated right after mowing, the nutrients of that grass were going to flow off into the stormwater system. Those two things weren't put together. All right. Um, Instrumental and ecosystem knowledge were positively correlated. Correlated. Okay, you can look at the study. This is a. So, what it meant, my city folks, and I will caricaturize them because we have quite a variety of opinions, but my colleagues think in general that anybody who has a lawn and really, you know, has the exceptional lawn quality and is instrumental, they really know how to grow a lawn, they don't understand what it's doing to the ecosystem. But these guys are higher in ecosystem knowledge and higher in what they should do on the lawns. All right? So those things were tied, which suggests there may be individuals that could be block uh, leaders around behavior and tie those two things together for folks who are newly moving into the area or something like that. The paper develops a few of those ideas. You don't want to take one study around a single variable and design an entire education program, but this is heading in that direction. So that's knowledge. Let's look at interventions. All right, and uh, there's actually substantial work on this in forestry and agriculture. So urban less, urban a little less. So let's just see if some of these ideas. We um, hosted two discussions in a very short period of time, so you wouldn't expect any change from an intervention that small, right? But they got the survey. They came, um, oh, let's see, grass growing season. They came right about end of June. All right, so the grass is up. They've done some behavior. They remember it's summer. And then we're talking about ideas. Then they've got a month. And we had to end with the summer because of uh, money, but also because of people's ability to focus and show up for discussion groups. And grass, thinking about grass. Oh, sorry. These are online. I, I think they're online as they, we divide them out in terms of types of knowledge and types of discussion. Um, we had multiple groups in both sites, hosted them. Um, it, there were behaviors that were open, and then there were where we asked them to fill things out. So for example, they could draw their yard and be thinking about it so they could visualize it. They then had at one point to select a type of change they'd like to do. We hosted it with folks who cared about exceptional lawn. There are folks who came in there and wanted greener, better golf course lawn. And we were going to work with them, low input lawns, and folks who said, how fast can I get rid of my lawn and convert it to a rain garden or a prairie or something like that? And so we work through some of these behaviors or conversion practices and plan. So commitment on the person's part, working it through, how were they going to do it? Next step, those are all behavioral modification practices. So what happened? This is a paper that I was always curious about. You know, you see your students. What happened when they went home and saw that next door? Did they just sit? at the front door or out, look out the window? Or did they walk across and tell the neighbor about it? All right, so a diffusion mentality. So do they, do individuals who were with us in discussion, this is one discussion, and it's for, and within the next month, did they share that information with a neighbor? Did, what factors caused them to do that? And what information did they share? And what prevented them from doing it? All right, so I'm going to pretty close to the end. Sorry, this is cut off. 34% of the people in the discussions shared an idea after one session. 
So this is a spread beyond what our, in our programs impact. So when you're evaluating impact, understanding how far and how it spreads, information shared was very concrete. We may have discussed nutrient cycles. That was not what they shared, right? They shared the how to do the thing, the concrete thing, especially in the first time round. Mow the grass height, like you said, a little bit on weeds because everybody talks about weeds, right? You, you don't, can't talk about anything else. And fertilizing with clippings. Those were the dominant things they shared out of lawn behavior. They may have talked about other things like how to have more butterflies or other things, you know, if they were converting. The barriers were temporal, spatial, and perception. Temporal. What happens in Minnesota in August? Everybody goes to the lake. So their neighbor wasn't there to share. Or in Florida, what we learned in wildfire was they hadn't sold the lots next door, right? So, or people went back to Minnesota. So the temporal piece, how what happens in other areas like that. The spatial piece what had more to do with barriers of structure. So highways, who they shared with proximity. They don't talk to the people behind them. They talk to the people adjacent and not across. And that's, remember, we have curbs and streets and things like that. And then perception. As one guy, I had the quote in here, cut it. One guy said, well, look at my lawn. Do you think they'd believe anything I say? So, you know, they understood identity and how, what that means. So essentially, what we found is that attending the discussion did have a statistical impact, um, that years owning the house mattered. Now, why? Did they have social capital have, have, from having been here for a long time? Did they have more age just because they happened to own the house more, so maybe a little authority? Would, that would have to be explored. Having kids at home. If you have kids in your home, any, anybody have kids at home that play in the yard? You, you end up talking because you're watching your kids. Uh, and then uh, at the suburban effect, urban effect had, a, had an impact. Highland Park, the urban place, more talking, smaller lots. And then here's a, a common measure of social capital and involvement. It, how many events generally ci civically do, do you engage in? So this is, these are individuals who don't sit on the couch a lot. But they have different levels of, of impact. And remember, it's such a small sample size that you know, the statistical significance, if you'd have to do a bigger one to actually tease these out more. So finally, let's back it out to big. Because it, for all of you, the, the conceptual, you put these little pieces of knowledge in, if it doesn't fit in that conceptual map they have about an ecosystem. So think about your conceptual map. What do you think an ecosystem is? And what does a homeowner? Because if you don't understand that, it's going to be very difficult to work with them on, at, across decision makers, homeowners, scientists. So what Maria did is she basically worked with our ecologists, and they felt comfortable with these three categories. And I'm giving you the associated language so you'll recognize them. Those are ecologists. We asked them, what's in your yard? The what? What is happening? Linkages. And how is the yard connected to the city? Now, the city to them is a sociopolitical concept, right? So it may, we wanted to liberate them from what's with your waterway. Um, and th this is more of a, a discourse analysis, so you'd have to read the stories, read the paper. But the short of it is that it's complex and there are gaps. So they have a complex idea. So here's, as those of you who are talking about growing as to a certain height and the length of the, the um, roots and thinking about that, one of the things homeowners are still trying to do, and this is this idea of you know, keeping things the same, is that they wanted their yard to be stable. Well, if you look at grass as a species, it isn't stable, and it won't be. And you can put as much fertilizer as you want right here, and it's not going to give you the benefit. All right. So getting an idea of, and they want, in, in general, there are other papers that document that the front yard is as close to their living room as they can get it. Right? They want it stable. So working with them on cycles and linkages, they, many people understand stopping. They don't understand letting flow. 
right? Where do you want insects to move or not move? Things like that. Prominent gaps are biodiversity. I'm sorry, uh, anyone who cares about anything but a bird or a butterfly, repeatedly asked in many different qualitative ways without encouraging, this was what came up. So how do we enrich that concept? And even some of you just talked about going into the soil. Are you kidding? So starting to think a little bit about that. And then services. Lovely concept many of my graduate students working on, many of you working on. But thinking about what that means. How is that a service? That might be a place that needs a lot more work. The bottom line is it has to be part of a story. All right. So even though I broke it out and made it rigid and rarefied, it's part of a story. Well, I really love it when my kids are out playing. And then I have a little bit of time and I, have, I can spend in the garden and I get a couple more plants put in because what I really want is color on that side of the house. It's a story about why I'm doing things. It's not, and being able to fit that story and adjust it just a little bit. How about not chrysanthemums? All right, so with climate change, we may have different stories. Um, but the work goes on. Wonderful people doing a lot of work. I gave you a couple papers, and you can look at some of those other papers if you care about it. And if anybody in here doesn't work on urban ecosystems, these theories, concepts, methods are all used in the system you're working with even built systems. So now I'm working more on anticipatory governance, looking a scale up in decision making, and social networks, the use of social networks and ecosystem services. Everybody's going on doing other things from street sweeping and around forestry. If anybody cares about an EAB, Shinzia did a lovely little paper with our data on EAB. I know there's a substantial amount of work on that. And for more information, you can go to our site. Thank you to funders, to everybody. Discussion. Thanks. <laughs>